Happy Father's Day. I was your Mother's Day, too. I don't know how that worked out, but I love it. Welcome, everybody, to Community United Methodist Church. My name is Betty Leonard, and I'm going to be your liturgist today. Uh, we want to welcome everybody who's here and anybody who's watching online. And if you are watching online, be sure to refer to that little chat button so we can communicate with you. Uh, would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day and for the rain that you have sent us, Lord. We thank you so much. And we ask blessings on all the fathers that are here today, and we thank you for everyone. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the, the announcements this week, it says altar flowers this week were in honor of Aaron Beltran's 28th birthday. <laughs> And it doesn't mention it on here, but there was also another birthday this week. Dustin McEwen had a birthday this week. <laughs> I'll go for it. Dustin is more than 28. <laughs> and Debbie Harrelson had a birthday this week. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Actually, both got another one? Oh my gosh. Oh. <laughs> Missing anyone? <laughs> Anybody else? Ah, oh, and blessing up, blessings upon all of you. Actually, both my kids have birthdays this month too. Unfortunately, I spaced them out between paydays. It was kind of tough when <laughs> it was kind of tough when I was a single mom. Okay, let's get on with this now. Uh, the next announcement is that Monday through Friday this week, the church office will be closed. And if there is an emergency, please call the Reverend Buddy Moore back there. Um, and tomorrow, let's see, is the uh, 11 o'clock is a drop off for the youth camp. I guess that's for the people that are going. And Dustin and Aaron and Emily are all going to be at youth camp this week. Um, tomorrow at 2 p.m. we're going to meet in the warehouse. This is Feed the People uh, Day tomorrow when we prepare the bags of food and we take them up to Camelot apartment complex. And they've all been very gracious, and few of them have started coming to church now, and it's absolutely glorious. So, and then tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. is a community dinner in the warehouse. And then the next Sunday on the 26th at 5.30, we're going to have another dinner church. So please come to that. Um, it's a little different than community dinner in that uh, Dustin is going to share some words about Jesus. And it, it's really very nice, so please, please come to that. So uh, let's see, what's next? Oh, if you'd all stand, please, and join me in the call to worship. <clears throat> Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Praise Song. Sound the tambourine, the sweet lyre with the harp. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon, on our feast day. For it is a statute for Israel, an ordinance of the God of Jacob, who made it a decreeing Joseph when God went out over the land of Egypt. And as you're still standing, let us sing, Praise the Lord Who Reigns Above, number 96 in your hymnal, or the words will be on the screen.
Be seated. Amen. Well, good morning, church. How is everyone doing this morning? Great. It is glad to see each and every one of you here. My name is Dustin McEwen, and I am the pastor here. Um, first, I just want to say thanks to Buddy for filling in for me last week. Um, I was a little bit more horizontal than I am today, and so I appreciate being able to um, call on people at the last minute when I'm not able to make it in. And second, happy Father's Day, right? <laughs> I'll never forget July 21st, um, 10 a.m. or 10 p.m. No, um, we were playing spades with some good friends of ours and my wife was writing down her contraction times. <laughs> and even though they were at five minutes and we lived over an hour away from the hospital, she was like, well, they're not very consistent, so I think we're good. And we drove in the middle of the night, stopped at Allsup's in Brownfield, Texas, made it to the hospital in time for my giant-headed son to be born. <laughs> and that's how I became a father. So, um, you know, all of you dads, the role that you play, all of you men, um, thank you for who you are. We would not be here without you. And so I'm going to ask some of our students to come forward and help me real fast. Um, so even students in the back, y'all can come help. And students in the front, y'all can come help. We have a nice little pin um, on your behalf that talks about being a man of God. And so I'm going to have the students pass these out. So grab a handful and run to all the men. Where'd Bob Walsh go? Oh, he's hiding. <clears throat> so this is just our way as a church of saying thank you for being who you are, that you are be blessed beyond measure this day and all day. And if you don't get one, make sure to raise your hand or we'll have a basket at the back. Now, I apologize. One of the ladies told me that they got their pin home and it broke. And so I hope this pin lasts longer than that. But we do have extra Mother's Day pins if yours did break. All right, so the basket's over here, guys. Thanks, Utes. We appreciate your help, especially since I didn't tell y'all y'all were going to do that. And I hope y'all bear with me because that's just one of a few audibles I'm going to play in worship today. All right. Um, and being the pastor here, we value being a people of prayer. Um, I'm going to pray over specifically all of the men and all the fathers today. Uh, but if there is a concern after I finish, if you would lift that name or that person up, then we'll all respond, Lord, hear our prayer. Then we'll close saying the Lord's Prayer together. So let's take a moment to silence our hearts and minds and go to God in prayer.
Father, first, we do just want to thank you for who you are in our lives, that you are Father, Son, and Spirit, and how you work in our lives in midst. Um, for the rain that you've given us, to the rain that's promised, um, but this morning specifically, God, we just want to thank you for the men in our lives. <laughs> I thank you for my dad, part of my namesake, Roy, um, for the godly influence he is in my life still to this day. I thank you um, for the men that have been father figures in each and every one of our lives, whether they are biological or not. And I pray um, that as you continue to work in uh, these men's lives, that you would allow them to be just a godly example of what manliness looks like. That when they are called to be bold and courageous, you would help them to do so. When you call them to be gentle and humble, that you would help them to do so. And that you would just be with each and every one of them, that you would bless them, um, their children, their grandchildren, some of their great-grandchildren, God. And that because of the faithfulness of the men that are here this morning, that your word will be spread from generation to generation. Um, and Father, as we come and we celebrate, I know that some of us also come this morning and we mourn. And we lament things that we've lost and people that we know that need you. And so it's during at this time that we lift these people up unto you. Lord, hear our prayers. 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 Wayne's family. Lord, hear our prayers. 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 And Father, we trust that you're with these and all things, and that you're with us as we pray the prayer that you taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven. Let us all stand as we sing, Break Thou the Bread of Life. It's number 599 in the hymnal, or the words will also be on the screen.
Indeed. Please remain standing. <laughs> It'll be on the screen. <laughs> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Be seated.
It's time for children's church. All children, time for children's church. So will you please stand for the reading of the scripture? The scripture reading today is from John chapter 6, verses 32 to 40. Then Jesus said unto them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. And you may be seated once again. And if you would, join me in prayer. Father, I just ask that you continually send the power of your spirit upon us, that you would soften our hearts and open our ears. And Lord, I ask that you allow the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be pleasing and acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. One day in high school, I was running for a cross-country race, and I heard a little smack talk coming beside me. And I looked down, and there was a piece of bread, the gun shot. And I just looked at it, and I said, yeah, you're toast. Uh, If you like that one, a piece of bread was breaking up with another piece of bread. And it said, you deserve better than this. I have a few more, but I'm afraid y'all might be rolling in the aisles afterwards. And a nice little pun right there for you. Can you think of the absolute best meal that you have ever had in your life? Like, just picture it. It's almost lunchtime now, so I want to talk about food for a second. Like, Ashley made a beef wellington, um, filet mignon, wrapped in some sort of sauce with some pastry, oh my goodness, right? I mean, it was an expensive piece of meat, but man, was it worth it. Or um, lamb. I am a huge fan of lamb. You didn't know that about me. It's my favorite meat. We take a rack of lamb, we slice it, we put some little garlic and lemon on it. Oh, it's Mexican food. Enchiladas, rianos, tamales. Like, we can just stop the service and go to lunch right now, right? (laughs) Think about the best food that you ever had, but how probably after six, eight hours, you were probably hungry again, right? What Jesus is telling us here is that he is better than the best food that is out there, that we have to have food as a necessity that he is the necessity of our souls. And he's doing it in this huge context of what's going on in John chapter 6. And so if you'll just give me a little bit of time, I'm going to tell you all all of what's going on in the sixth chapter of John. And if you haven't read it in a while, I urge you, take seven minutes this week and read John 6, because there's a whole lot going on in this chapter. It starts off with Jesus doing what Jesus does. Jesus is teaching a lot of people. And it's Sunday, so Chick-fil-A is closed. And the crowds, Jesus is teaching a little bit longer and longer. And it'd be like if I went to 12.15, 12.20, and some of y'all would probably be giving me the Methodist salute, like, um, it's time to get out of here. 
And the disciples are like, Jesus, um, it's time for you to get the people out of here. Chick-fil-A is closed. Nobody's going to be able to get any food. And Jesus looks. Um, it's actually told in every single gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, in Mark, it says Jesus looks out at the crowds and has compassion on them. And as he has compassion on this group of hungry men and women, he sees a little boy with just five loaves of bread. I've actually got seven up here today because seven's a important number of completeness. And they have this little barley loaf. And Jesus takes this small loaf from this small boy and he just starts to break it. And he blesses God. And he starts handing it out, piece after piece after piece. 5,000 men, three, five, 7,000 women and children are there. And they all have their fill. It's so crazy that the people, they're wandering around looking for Jesus, saying, Jesus, we want you to be our king. We want to worship you because you're the guy that gives us Chick-fil-A whenever we want it, right? I mean, they're hungry, and he fills their stomachs, and they need a king that can do that. And Jesus runs away in John chapter 6, like he so frequently does, into the wilderness, and he hides out there for the evening. The cow crowds kind of disperse a little bit, and Jesus looks out and he sees his disciples sailing across the Lake of Galilee. We call it the Sea of Galilee. It's a giant lake. It makes grindstone look pitiful, right? It's pretty big. And as Jesus sees his disciples, he decides just to do what Jesus does. And so he um, leaves the people and he weaves through the crowds and he just starts walking across water. I mean, just another day in the life of Jesus, right? Feed seven, 10,000 people, walk across the water and I love it how it says in John 6, 24, what the crowds are doing. The crowds have been fed. They're wondering what's going on with Jesus. Let me actually get to John instead of Kings. You'll get Kings later. You'll like it, I hope. In John chapter 6, verse 24, it says, The crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, so they themselves got in their boats and they went to Capernaum, and I love these last three words. What does it say they were doing? I mean, of course they're looking for Jesus. He just fed them one of the best meals they'd ever had, and it was free. They wanted to make this man king, and they're like, where in the world is Jesus? Makes me just wonder how frequently in the church we're looking for Jesus. And so they're looking for Jesus, and they eventually find him. And Jesus, as he finds them, he tells them this simple phrase in John 6.35. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. You see, Jesus had given them bread that fat satisfied at their stomach, but now he's telling them, I've got bread that'll satisfy your soul's bread that's going to satisfy it so much more. And the people, I think the people were confused. I mean, how many of y'all have been hungry in your life before? Right? Some of us by choice, because we choose to fast and abstain on purposes. Um, some of us have probably been hungry by necessity because we just didn't have the finances to get it through. And the people, they're there listening to Jesus. You just fed us all, and now you're saying you're going to give us bread that won't go away. And Jesus is echoing the Old Testament when he's doing this. And I've had several people say, hey, the Old Testament isn't really that important. We're just New Testament Christians. Um, the Old Testament is vital for our faith. The Old Testament reminds us of the stories of the people of God and who God was and how God worked for thousands and thousands of years before Christ. And one of the first things that happens in the New Testament uh, very early on is the story of a man named Moses. Y'all remember Moses, right? He had a big boat with all the animals. Oh, see, I tried tricking you there. No, that's Abraham. Moses, 
He led the Israelites out of captivity. They were slaves for 400 years. We haven't even been a nation for 400 years, right? He, they were slaves for 400 years. He leads them out of slavery. And you know what the people start doing as soon as they get out of Egypt? We're hungry, right? Come on, Moses, why did you lead us out into the wilderness so that we could starve to death? <laughs> in, Genesis, in Exodus 16, 14, or in 16, 4, that's the verse. It says, I'm going to rain down bread from heaven for you. I don't know if y'all have ever seen the movie Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs with your grandkids. I just picture, um, I hope it's not baguettes. Baguettes are pretty tough, right? Could you imagine this falling from 200 feet just poof? Like, yeah, that actually hurt a little bit. I'd hope it'd be something more like a French loaf, a little softer, raining down from heaven. Could you just imagine, like, bread, just like if that, whew. What happens is this cloud descends upon the Israelites, this huge dew. It's in Exodus 16, 14. A layer of dew lifts up, and there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance as fine as frost on the ground. The gra clouds lift up. There's the little bitty cylinder things that are all over the ground. And I love what they name it in verse 31. It says, the house of Israel called it manna because what is it? It's like a coriander seed that's white. that kind of tastes like wafers made with honey. They literally name what is left behind, what is it? It's covering the ground. And the commands that they're told is six days, I want you to gather this, what is it, this bread. I want it to sustain you. I want it to feed you. But on the seventh day, you're supposed to gather twice as much on the sixth day so that on the seventh day you can rest and trust who God is. So for 40 years, <laughs> that was the magic number that I turned earlier this week. For 40 years... Day after day, this cloud descended upon the Israelites, gave them this mystical, magical food. They didn't know what it was, but it kind of tasted sweet. And they ate after it, and it sustained their bodies. This bread from heaven to feed them. And Jesus looks at the crowds and he says, just as Moses provided bread from heaven, so I am the bread of life. Whoever eats from me will never be hungry, and whoever drinks from me will never be thirsty. But it's not just Moses that I think that he's alluring to. Um, there's actually a fun little story about Elisha, the prophet, in 2 Kings chapter 4. I'm sure some of you may have heard this before, but I hope it's a surprise to some of y'all. Um, it's, about, it's about Elisha, and it says, A man came from Belshazzar bringing food from the first fruits of the man of God, 20 loaves of bread, a barley, and fresh ears of grain in a sack. And Elisha says, Give it to the people, let them eat. The servant said, How can I set this before 100 people? So he repeated, Give it to the people, let them eat. For thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left. He set it before them, they ate and had some left, according to the word of the Lord. That seems strikingly familiar to the story of Jesus feeding people, right? Like one person thinks it does. Like this is the point when you say, yes, Dustin. Like, I mean, hopefully I'm not the only one seeing that. Except it's not near as grand or grandiose as Elisha actually has 20 loaves of bread for 100 people, a little bit more realistic, and he feeds all of the people there. And so what Jesus is doing, he's taking this bread that he has with him, he's breaking it, he's giving it to the people, he's saying, you remember what Moses did in the wilderness? I've got something better than that. You remember one of the best prophets in Elisha? I can do something even far greater than that, that if you trust in me, you'll have bread that will endure forever. And the reality is, is he's not just talking about physical food, but about 
satisfying our wants and our desires. Because if we're honest with ourselves, we live in a land and a time and a place where you can buy sleep, but you can't buy peace. You can buy entertainment, escapism, but you can't buy joy. And if you pay enough money, you can even buy your reputation, but you can't buy your character. And what Jesus is saying is, I am freely giving all of these things away to anybody that would come after me. That what I have is so much better than a nice little French baguette. But I have words that lead to life and life eternally. I believe that each and every one of us, we have this heart, this desire that only can be filled by the substance of God himself. That we all long after things in this world, and if you don't know what longing is, come talk to me later, right? We long for things, and a lot of us spend so much of our time and our energy trying to figure out what that longing will be fulfilled with. So some of us seek after things like drugs or sex or money to fill that longing. Some of us do it with things like Netflix and escapism and just we don't want to deal with reality. And what Christ is saying is I am the bread of life. One of the early fathers of the church, Augustine, says this, God has made us for himself and our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. You see, despite all that this world has to, eat or for e to offer for each and every one of us, we will only know peace and joy and hope when we fill that place with the bread of life with Christ. And he's saying, not only can I satisfy you with a meal that's going to last just for a little bit, but I'm going to satisfy you until your heart is content. And church, this is his promise to each and every one of us is all too often we settle for something far less than Christ himself, and we settle for just being the, ugh. Right? None of y'all have ever had one of those uh, days, right? The uh day is when you wake up on your 40th birthday and go to a disaffiliation breakfast about the United Methodist Church. That's a uh, <laughs> right? That's everybody's joy and delight. And what Christ is saying is I have something so much better for you. And all you have to do is to come to me. But I think being a good West Texan, a good American, a lot of times it's really hard for me to go to God with those things. Because we're taught, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, do it by yourself. You know, Eastern New Mexico has that same mentality, right? And I'm going to do it. And if I can't come hell or high water, I'm going to try my... Whatever. Yeah, darndest. I was like, there's a Christian word out there somewhere for what I'm trying to say. And Christ is like, you're right. Because sometimes the only thing that I can really do is just say, God, this is my life that's been broken for you. And in the midst of the chaos and craziness, I'm just going to lay it here for you. And we remember the words of Christ that says that as he cares for the sparrows, the air, the lilies, and the field, that he cares even more for us. And so I don't know if it's your health or your finances or your emotions. I don't know if it's the state of the world, but I feel like each and every one of us have something that we can surrender just a little bit more to the bread of life. And what God longs to do with the mess of our lives is to fill us with the power of his presence so that we can know of his goodness and his joy 
so that we will remember the words that he spoke thousands of years ago when he was telling his disciples, look at the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I have said that to you even before you've seen and don't believe. For everything that my Father has given me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of the Father. And this is the one that sent me, that I should lose nothing that he has given me. I'll raise it up on the last day. God has given us the gift of the bread of life and the Son of Jesus Christ. He is here not just to satisfy your stomachs, but to satisfy your souls. And so whatever is going on in your life, I pray that you'll hand it to him and trust the good gift from the Father will rain down. Let us pray. Father, I pray to rain down the bread of life upon us as the rain is coming down upon us now. That you would soften those places in our lives that have turned hard and bitter. And that you'd help us to know that your words are not just now, but for all of eternity. Fill us with the power of your spirit, the true thing that can satisfy now and forevermore. Bless us in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I know that as we sing this final hymn, if there are things that you'd like to pray about, the altar is open. If you'd like me to pray with you, I'll be standing up here at the front. If you want to know more about what it means to give your life to Christ or to join our church, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about any of those things. But if you would, please stand and join us. Jesus is all the world to me. Please let us sing. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy.
Amen. And you may be seated. Um, like I said, I'm going to throw a couple of curveballs at y'all today, and this is the second one that I have. I just wanted to give a brief little update from annual conference. Jean Starch, our lay delegate, is sick this morning, so she couldn't be here to say a few things. Um, first, I just want to say that I was reappointed to start my fifth year here as your pastor. Actually, he said if our name wasn't on the list, we needed to go back to where we came from. And I was like, well, Ernie, so I go back to the hotel and preach there? <laughs> um, and second, I'm sure those of y'all um, that know anything about the Methodist Church know there is a little bit of division right now. Um, there was a lot of talk at this annual conference about disaffiliation and what it means for a church to possibly leave the United Methodist Church. Um, I just want you to hear me say as your pastor, um, our leadership has not discussed any of this um, in detail yet. And so I've already heard rumors, well, we're going to the Global Methodist Church, we're staying United Methodist Church. Well, um, leadership has to vote before anything else can happen. And to my knowledge, leadership has not voted. We will let you know if leadership talks about it, what leadership decides. We will be honest and transparent about the future. Um, I will tell you that I am one of the leaders of the more traditional group in New Mexico, but my um, <laughs> commitment to this church is no matter what happens in this church, if this church decides to stay, if this church decides to go, as long as you will have me, I will be your pastor. Um, <laughs> I believe that we can faithfully fulfill our mission as a local church as United Methodist, and we could do so if God called otherwise. Um, I do not have the answers. Um, I wish I did. I told people multiple times at annual conference, if I had some of the question answers to some of the questions you had, I would have bet at the Kentucky Derby and retired. Because <laughs> if you hit the trifecta, it was 100,000 to one. 100,000 to one, so I mean, I could have, you know, bet 10 bucks and retired. <laughs> what I do know is that no matter what happens in the future of this local church, is that if we can continue to focus on worshiping God, making disciples of Jesus Christ, and sending people out into mission into the world, that God will be faithful to us. And so no matter what the future will hold, I covet your prayers for me and the church, that we would listen faithfully to where God is calling us to go, to stay. <laughs> I told, jokingly, tell the SPRC, my favorite song every appointment year is from The Clash, Should I Stay or Should I Go? <laughs> um, sadly, the denomination that we're a part of right now is going through a divorce, and each local church has to face that question. This is your church, this is your voice, and your vote. I, as a pastor, have one decision to make, and you, as a congregation, have another decision to make. I do want you to know, no matter what decision you make, <laughs> I will love you, and as long as you have me, I will be your pastor. And that's all I can promise you right now. I would ask that over the upcoming months that we treat each other with love and respect and unity, can we do that? Okay, 70% of y'all said yes, so we should be good. <laughs> and that we'll trust God in the process, because he's the one that got us here, right? Yes. And this is his church, not our church, right? Yes. So if we remember those things, God will be good, because God is good. All and all the time. God and so with that, I'm just, thank you. I look forward to... <laughs> On July 1st, I'll be y'all's third longest pastor starting my fifth year. <laughs> now, I still got munchkins running around that I want to get out of school from here, Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. Um, but thank you for entrusting this congregation to our pastoral leadership and care. Um, we love you. We care for you. We want to be here for you. Um, it's because of your faithfulness and support that we have a building like this, that we are able to do the ministry that God has called us to do. And so I just want to say thank you. 
um, for all that you have done, all that you are doing, and all that you will do for our church. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't say part of that is with your finances at the back. Um, you can faithfully support our church um, through your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness um, in a multitude of ways. And as we leave this place and prepare to leave it, I'm going to ask that you stand and that we would all sing together the praises of who God is in joint doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. everyone hear me? Okay, there we go. Turn around. <laughs> so I remember Father's Day, you know, specifically whenever I became a father. I remember that specific night. Um, so Emily, she was in the middle of, you know, labor. <laughs> and uh, the nurse was doing something called tug of ro war with her. So basically every contraction, Emily was supposed to pull this rope and the nurse was pulling it equally with her in order to kind of help stimulate everything. And our nurse, once again, this was at the height of COVID. And so our nurse at the time was wearing four masks. And so 15 minutes in, she handed the rope to me. She's like, all right, dad, it's your turn. And where the nurse was on the bed, I was on the side of the bed trying to do my best that I could. And an hour and a half in, I felt that knot that you get, that spasm whenever your back gets pulled. And I didn't say anything. I was just like, oh, okay, I'm just gonna ignore it. And the next morning, Theo's crying, and she's like, or Emily's like, hey, Aaron, can you, can you get Theo? And I was like, I can't move. <laughs> and as you can imagine, she gave me, like, this death glare. <laughs> and I, I've only seen that death glare a couple of times in my life. And one of them being whenever I saw Dustin this morning, whenever we pranked his door with Texas Longhorn stuff. So if you want to see a good prank, go see that. And then another one is every time God tells me to give something up, I imagine myself giving that to God. And so as you go into this week, I just want you to, whatever God has put on your heart to give up or give to him, you know, whether it's finances, because that's always stressful for me specifically, or if it's something that you're struggling with, like abuse, or if you're, you know, uh, drug addiction or drinking, just give up to him and I can guarantee he's going to do a lot with that. So as you go into this week, I just pray that you give anything that he needs, and he'll tell you, hey, I need that. Don't give him that face. All right, blessings. <laughs>